And welcome back to Jeff Kudange Live here at Citizen Television, talking about code of conduct for churches in Kenya. This booklet released just today, literally hot off the press, talking about the code of conduct of churches. And I've got great guests on the bench today discussing this. Bernice Gashego, let me start with you in this section and say there are literally hundreds and hundreds of churches in Kenya. How do you affect, how do you enforce a code of conduct on all these churches? Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, this code does not exist to enforce anything on all the churches. Like I said earlier, it's a voluntary code that a church can subscribe to and adopt as a, an addition or a supplement or an addendum to their existing constitution. The enforcement in the code is that it makes the church accountable to its members. And for instance, if it's an umbrella body, then that umbrella body holds the individual church to account. So this code does not exist and to be enforced on all the churches. It's for all the churches, all the umbrella bodies, all the para, uh, church organizations that choose to subscribe to this code of governance. Yes. Father Joseph, do you agree? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, that uh, it is not mandatory to follow this code of conduct. But isn't that a problem? Because if it's not mandatory, some will just ignore you. Some will just ignore this code of conduct. At their own peril. Why? Because, again, we are trying to run away from the idea that government can come in and regulate the church. would want to see ourselves putting in some kind of mechanism that help. Not that we do not have such. We've been, you know, working in, in this, this field. We have had, you know, <coughs> some kind of ethics that have guided us as religious leaders and as churches. But this time we want to formalize our way of doing things. That is, we want to engage with each other so that we do not have, you know, uh, patches of, you know, uh, 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 ethics of conducts or codes of conducts that uh, do not agree with each other. Yeah. Well, you may improve, improve uh, on what we have, we have come up with. You may say this one does not work with us, this one may not work, but at the beginning, it's, at least we have something that we have formally agreed this is what is going to guide us as churches. Yeah. Reverend Dr. Makanda, look, you served at the National Council of uh, Churches of Kenya, right? NCCK. Mm -hmm. You served there. What does this say about the diversity of denominations? You know, uh, Jeff, one of the things that you have to appreciate is that we have a freedom of religion and belief in this country. Uh, to that extent, <clears throat> as it's provided for and enshrined in the Constitution, it's possible for you today, Jeff, uh, to start Jeff Ministries International, go to the registrar of uh, societies and be registered, Use your, uh, get a constitution or get a lawyer or get the registrar's office to give you uh, registration. And to that extent, we are seeking that uh, in the coming days that it's going to be possible for us to separate registration and regulation of churches from the Societies Act to a different statute. And in that statute, we do hope that it will be possible for us to be able to say a code of conduct is included in that statute so that then it allows us, the religious people, to be able to be governed separate from what is existing today. Because what is existing today is an open book for all societies that are not regulated elsewhere. The football clubs have moved out, the matatus have moved out, one or two others have moved out, but we have remained there with chamas, with uh, uh, all other uh, 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 movements uh, that exist. And so we, we are thinking that it is going to be possible for us to have a different legislation, an act of parliament that gives authority to religious institutions to self-regulate, the form of which uh, Kenyans can participate because uh, uh, legislation in this country is open uh, for public participation, but we do know what it is that we want. And so going forward, this might be a sample of what we will be proposing 
in that new legislation. We think that a time has come for religious institutions, churches, uh, uh, the mosques, uh, the temples, and, and, and even ATR, the African traditional religion, to find a statute that guides their form of worship, their conduct, because the, the CID, the DCI, the police, and whoever seem unable, they seem to be a handicap when issues arise up, but yet we understand what is right and what is wrong. And so if we are given that mandate in a new statute, then it's going to be possible in the diversity of denominations. The National Council of Churches of Kenya has about 32 that are members. The Evangelical Alliance of Kenya has about 900 denominations. The OAIC, the Organization of Institutional Churches, I think has how many? Over 80. <coughs> Over 80. And the registrar the other day told us there are 40,000 denominations registered in Kenya. In Kenya? In Kenya. 40,000. 40,000 religious institutions that are registered. So. Even if you, you, you tried uh, to regulate 40,000, I mean, it's a Herculean task. Absolutely. Yes. Archbishop, let me ask you this. Speaking of you know, all these numbers, will this document apply the same way for Catholics and Anglicans as it would, let's say, Acorino and Legio Maria? Um, it will not exactly apply the same way. Why? Uh, the Catholics, the Anglicans already have structures. Some of these other churches have no structures. And today, in the panel at All Saints Cathedral, we had you know, one apostle who said, you know, we don't have those structures. Uh, so, so the way it applies to the Catholics and the Anglicans, or those established churches, which already have constitutions, uh, they have uh, management structures, they have synods, they have standing committees, uh, they have uh, forms that uh, you know, hold accountable the leader. Uh, even the authing system, when we take the oath of office, there are things the leader pronounces himself that I will subscribe to this sentence when it is determined upon me, I will relinquish my position, uh, and we have that set, 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 set uh, uh, code of conduct uh, we, uh, with those structures that are already existing. But what it does to the Catholics and the Anglicans is that, uh, and, and more so to the rest, it has given us an opportunity to have, uh, uh, to have created an expectation that uh, as a church leader, these are the expectation uh, across board. Uh, it has created an opportunity, a framework uh, on which uh, the public can see us and uh, are able to pinpoint and say, you know, if you go off this line, then you are off the curve. Right. Uh, so that is what I see the code does to all of us. But it also gives us an opportunity as uh, the mainland churches with structures already to go inside and look at some of the gaps because you can find some gaps that may not uh, exactly be uh, in our already existing structures and uh, uh, you know regulations in in our constitution that this has given us an opportunity to pick one or two three things to tighten what we already have mm. so to some it will apply you know uh, at certain levels but to some it is a basic document for them because it don't have anything uh, to subscribe to to look at that can say this is how you manage resources this is how you manage people uh, this is how you make decision you're not going to be a unilateral uh, you know decision maker as a leader of that denomination you must have a board of directors you know they, they must meet this criteria and uh, uh, so, so that when you go overboard then people begin to check so, so we are creating a, a kind of a check and balance, a checklist, so that when a denomination is registered uh, and it registers itself into an umbrella body, we will have a, like this document, like a checklist. Have you complied with this? Is this, is this uh, do you have this? Uh, have you thought about it? Uh, have you put as a measure in your own denomination so that you have something to measure yourself against? So this is for self-measurement, and uh, what I'll do to the Anglican Church is to take it, uh, table it in a forthcoming synod, and say we have these uh, guidelines and code of conduct. Can we check areas in which we want to 
use this document to improve on our existing uh, documents okay. uh, so that mm. we, we, we are able to say, I have a checklist, then I can say, yes, this, I, I have complied, this, I've got. if I don't, then I say, what must I do? If I, I, I earn the capacity, yeah. then I invite others, uh, because we are also saying we need collegiality of the heads of churches, so that even if, uh, you know, uh, Father Mutia here uh, has been identified not to be doing the right thing, and his own denomination cannot rise up and say to him no, but we, the rest of le religious leaders in that spectrum, can be able to hold him accountable in that collegiality and say, look, we have a document, you are going overboard. Okay, can, you, can you check yourself against this? That's, that brings me to my very good point. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> Bernice and you're the legal mind amongst us, right? And forgive me if I play devil's advocate amongst all these religious no people. Problem. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but Paul McKenzie, if he's released today, what's to stop him from going back to Shakahola, to his sect, to his so-called people? What's to stop him? Well, um, mm -hmm. I think that's a multi-pronged, you know, we need to approach that question in a multi-pronged way. And let me start by saying we do have a penal code in our nation and criminal procedures. And so when any Kenyan um, commits a criminal offense, then the criminal justice system must step in, whether he's a church leader or a shoeshine or whomever. Um, but let me just uh, talk a little bit, uh, Jeff, about the Societies Act. And because I was Registrar General for many years, I used to be the registrar of political parties, of trade unions, of football clubs, and during the dispensation of uh, President Mwai Kibaki, uh, the Minister for Justice then came up with the political parties bill. And in those days, uh, Jeff, you know, political parties would jump over the gate in Sharia House, I would be smuggled out, I had to have security, they would riot. Yeah. But the minute we got the Political Parties Act, discipline came <coughs> in. And, and I remember those days you could be in Ford Asili, Ford Kanu B, LDP, the same individual. Mm -hmm. But the Political Parties Act streamlined the political parties. Mm -hmm. I was Register of Trade Unions, then we came up with the new labor laws. Mm -hmm. So again, those trade unions that would hound our office and would go in hiding were streamlined. Then the football clubs, Gorma here, AFC, they used to invade Sharia House. We came up with the Sports Act, and you don't hear about them. Mm -hmm. So for the churches, like was mentioned, it's time that we came up with, a, and, and religious organizations for that matter, mm -hmm. with a religious freedom bill. That, because the, the, the Societies Act truly is inadequate mm -hmm. in, to, to, to bring people to account, to hold these... Uh, rogue pastors, if you want to call it that. Mm. So everyone recognizes, including the churches, including government, that the Societies Act is inadequate. Mm. Mm. What the code has done is to say that those good churches, and, and we're not talking about the Catholics or the Presbyterians or Anglicans, because even from a government perspective, these churches have very strong internal government. Today, with all due respect, I can't say to anyone, um, the bishop of the Anglican Church. The Kenyans know who are those bishops and how they got there. Mm -hmm. But from the independent, Pentecostal, charismatic, I can just stand up and say I'm archbishop and no one would query it because there isn't an accountable system. So what this code is doing for the um, charismatic Pentecostals, and this was the group that approached Hesabika. We're saying we're going to give you a standard, a minimum standard. And the beauty with standards, it forces everyone to look critically at themselves. They may not be there, but they now have a standard to arise to. So this is what the code has done. It's put a standard. And for those well-meaning churches who are saying, yes, we want to be accountable. We want to have a standing. We want to be able to speak to government and say we have a moral standing. This is a welcome document, and it's a standard. Reverend Dr. Makanda, does this, I mean, again, you know, you, you think about the miracle, so-called miracle uh, yes. prophets and evangelists. Yes. And they call themselves that, by the way, prophets and evangelists. <laughs> what, 
what happens to that? I mean, <laughs> they will say, you know what, this document isn't worth the, the letters that it's written or the paper it's printed on. I think this document seeks to regulate the institution. The things that the institution ought to do, management, leadership, accountability, uh, how do you uh, order yourselves in terms of uh, integrity? But this document may not regulate the spirit, how people worship, what time they pray, when they pray, how they pray, who they call themselves in terms of their titles. This document has not been prepared for that. Mm. We leave that to the sacred books, uh, uh, the Quran, the Bible, for the Christians, right. the scripture says, and God appointed some to be apostles, some to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And so the, there will be people who call themselves for whatever it is. We will let them within their institution. If you go to the institutions that are mature and they have been regulated enough, they have procedures of appointing an evangelist. Who is an evangelist? Most likely to be somebody who has done at least a minimum of TE. TE means theological education by extension and has been prayed for and, and, and consecrated by the bishop for them to become evangelists. But for some institutions, like the one that uh, uh, Archbishop was mentioning, somebody will wake up in the morning and say, God has told me yeah. I am an evangelist. Yeah. I am a prophet. Mm. We have no way to verify, to either agree or deny. The only thing we will wait for is to see the fruit. Because by their fruit, you will know them. And so once we see, oh, this person is able to come and talk to Jeff, and you find Jeff has knelt down, has agreed, <laughs> then you begin to say, most likely this person might be an evangelist. Right. And we, we will pursue them. But the worst case scenario is Shakahola. Yes, the worst case scenario is Shakahola. Yes. And for Shakahola, let me just disclose that our religious leaders in Kilifi confronted the Shakahola preacher. They told him this is wrong. They went to the extent of reporting to the police. They reported to the children's department in Kilifi and in Malindi. This man was apprehended in 2018, but after two days he was released. And when he's released, he comes back saying, you know, Nelson, you are the one who reported me. I mean, so, you, so the religious leaders in Malindi yeah. did their bit, but because they did not have teeth to bite because of the weaknesses in law, as Bernice has said, then it was not going to be possible. Only the penal code and those that are adjudicate over the criminal justice were called in and they were the only ones who could have helped us. But in terms of help, uh, saying that Nelson Makana, because he's the general secretary of the Evangelical Alliance, stop this evangelist or stop this prophet, stop this apostle, we do not have that mandate. But right now, it is possible for the political parties to be able to say we are properly governed. Nobody can spring up if they have not gone through the ORPP uh, office. No, nobody today can actually come up and say, I have uh, my own political party and I, am, I have members and the, the members are scattered over the country. The vetting is thorough and is serious. I think we need a new law to be able to deal with those things. But in terms of what is spiritual, yeah. we will leave that to the designation of the religious books, for us, the Bible. So that then this denomination says we are governed by the scripture. And we have said in the guiding principles here that we subscribe to the holy scriptures, which is the Bible. And so if somebody then is teaching things that are outside the Bible, that denomination or that organization ought to be able to say, it is wrong. The neighbors and the brothers and the mentors or the colleagues, the peers, ought to come up and say it is wrong. But the peers and the mentors ought to be given some certain authority to be able to say, we, def we defrock you. In the Anglican mm. church, I think mm -hmm. there is the, there's defrocking. Yeah. Uh, they will say, you are no longer our priest. We have denounced you. And the public will know this man you are following has been rejected by their church. Yeah, but Reverend Drox, just for the record, and I'm, you know, I'm just putting it out there, somebody dropped the ball in Shakahola. Mm. Somebody dropped yes. the ball. Let's, yes. let's, let's, we all did. Uh, and, you know, Kenyans will 
quick to blame game. We all did, yes. Right? Everybody yes. dropped the ball yeah. and we're all accountable. Yes. All right. Bernice, Father, Reverend Doctor, Archbishop, we're going to take another break, come back and uh, talk some more because it's very interesting stuff.